So welcome to the last DL lab for this semester. Uh, today we'll be covering mainly two topics um, and a little bit of a third, which we'll discuss if we have time and if um, we're sort of clear on the other two. So today we'll be discussing, for starters, we'll be discussing uh, model deployment using Gradio. Uh, we'll be discussing hyperparameter tuning, which is going to be roughly a uh, short. We won't be going very in depth into the different types of hyperparameter tuning. We'll just be discussing the main, the the major ways you could sort of uh, implement this into your model models whenever you're uh, starting out, and uh, just a short way of trying out different things to um, sort of start optimizing. And lastly, and most importantly, which we'll be covering the most. Um, today is multi GPU training on PyTorch. So this is what our goals for today's lab are. Uh, essentially, what the plan is that this needs to be very well addressed, multi GPU training, because as we've seen, uh, models start to get very very large as you uh, go through different types of um, training schedules, right? Uh, we've seen that transformers as a whole tend to get extremely large and extremely difficult to train um, on, on something like a local machine because of its sheer size, right? We just don't have the computing power on our local CPUs or even single GPUs that Colab offers for us to be able to do uh, something meaningful on um, like tra training a transformer from scratch. Even fine-tuning a transformer on something like a single GPU or fine-tuning a very, very large deep learning model on a single GPU is very difficult. Um, as you may remember, we worked on something called ResNets earlier, which was just, uh, we, we didn't really do much with the ResNets. We just sort of implemented them and seen how we could fine tune something like that. Uh, we worked on ResNet 18 and VDD 16. And both of these, we could only fine tune because of computer restriction, right? A single GPU can only do so much. So today we'll be seeing how to um, implement multi-GPU systems and we'll see how you could potentially use a server. So I'll also show how, how to upload something to a server, um, run it there and sort of see results there. So that's what our goal is for today. Today we, uh, we also want to be fine tuning an entire ResNet from scratch because even on four high level GPUs, it takes an hour or so. So we'll be running a very, very small model and we'll just be comparing the time difference between how what it takes for a single GPU and what it takes for, a, for multiple GPUs. We'll train a simple net from scratch. So um, coming to model deployment, we'll start with that. We're using something called Gradio. It is a library on Python. Um, and uh, I'll just share you the documentation screen should give you a good idea of what I'm trying to explain. So this creates an interactive app and it does it nearly instantly. Um, it really doesn't take a while to do to do any of this and it's uh, pretty straightforward. Like for example, if you, once you've created an interface and you're able to give your inputs and outputs, It'll create something like a, a like this, which is like a web app of sorts. It's actually exactly a web app, and uh, you can either run it. You can either run it on your local host, or you can run it online, depending on how you want to do it. And you can even run it locally. So we'll be doing it on uh, Colab because it's easier, and we've been using Colab for the entirety of the lab sessions. So um, you can actually go through. I'll I'll send the documentation on the Meet chat. And you can actually go through this if you'd like right now. Um, so yeah, coming back to the screen here. So first, we'll have to start by pip installing radio. It's not a pre-installed package that comes with uh, Colab. It's taking a while to work. Yeah. 
so for the purposes of gradio you can either take a model and train it so you can either like for example create your own class like we've been doing so you could create something like a class connect and then you know, do whatever it is you want to or you could take a pre trained model which is what we plan on doing right now so you could um watch.hub.load and all of this is this documentation that i'm reading from i don't remember any of this in terms of like a long term thing you don't need to either um but it's a good idea to know what you're sort of doing as a whole and then dot eval because with a pre trained model we don't need to train it further right so we just need to make sure that it's set to eval so that there is no gradients that are big place here now um there is an error have i missed something yeah there's a colon that i missed should work so when we go back to this right there is going to be an image example which is what we are basically going to be doing so uh, you can take in your data through multiple components so even within image right there are multiple types of image types that we've seen before uh, we've seen pil types we've seen numpy arrays we've also seen them in opencv and you can use any of these but for simple purposes we'll just use something like a, a pil type image which is pretty pretty straightforward to do uh, also i won't be showing you the entire testing of the app i'm going to leave that up to you um simply because it is more interesting to do that so you will have the code once the lab sheet is uploaded i would recommend that you create an app you could try different types of models and sort of upload images from your own system and see how they work so here we are going to go to yeah so the uh, pre trained dataset is on something called an image net again something we have discussed before and these are essentially like labels for the image net dataset now these are available on the gradio app uh, github you can go and check those out there again this will be part of the lab sheet um, and we are just going to like load these onto our uh onto our collab notebook so that we have all the labels that we need for us to run so we're just going to run a requests uh an http requests so response is requests dot get and i have the link already and as you may have noticed um, the the separator is just next line so we need to make sure that we parse by next line so response dot text dot split so we we'll just print labels and get a quick clarity check as to what we're doing as you can see everything is here in our in an array form okay so coming back to documentation right so as you can see they've used an they've used they've defined a function and that function is what they pass to the interface so what the sepia function would they've created here is doing is that they're taking a filter that they've defined whatever that filter may be and they're just dot producting it with that and returning it right they're normalizing it to one and they're returning it 
that's what this function does now what we want to do is we want to create a prediction so we'll take the model that we've created uh input our data to that um we'll pa we pass the data to that using this function and this is the exact function uh specification that you need to have it needs to have only one input and it needs to have any any name works and it needs to return something uh if it's supposed to be returning an image of a type it needs to be returning an image of that type exactly um yeah so coming back to the collab now so we'll now we'll define our predict function what our input is we need to change that input to tensor so transform to two tensor So, um, as you may remember, the torch dot mn dot function. We generally used to import this as f, but now that I have it, I'll just use it like this. Um, we'll be using a softmax because that gives you the probability distributions again, something we've discussed before. And we'll pass the model, the model's output, uh, which is going to be in the form of a ReLU activation at the end, or our, not necessarily ReLU activation, just a standard linear output. And uh, we'll convert that to a softmax, then zero, and we'll just predict confidences. So confidences is exactly what the softmax output is, except we want to do it for each label so that it's just easier for us to note. Now I'm using i in range thousand because the again ImageNet has a thousand classes. So again, not, should not have. Yeah, and I need to return confidences. Right. So this is what our predict function looks like. We've taken a model. Model is a pre-trained ResNet on ImageNet. Here we've created the model here, right? We've created, we've gotten our uh, labels from this, which is just a simple responses, uh, simple requests dot get, and we've um, used the, we've used Gradio's labels that they provided. Uh, it's the same for every ImageNet label. It says that it was there on their website, so I used it. And we've created our predict function, which is what we need to pass to our interface. Now we need to create our interface. What does that look like? So we start by importing Gradio. And we create a demo interface. Here dot image. So uh, what this is doing, right? So this is going to pre predict the label, and it's only show uh, sorry shows the label and its probabilities. And because we don't want to see a thousand outputs, we'll only res we'll restrict it to four. We could restrict it to any number. No issues there. Uh, hopefully, having no errors, this should work. It has an error because this has to be capitalized. 
Bye-bye. So now we'll just run the demo dot launch uh, equal to two. So now you can you can either open it on your on another tab or you could just use it here, and this will give you. Answer. So this has essentially created an API for you, which has deployed this model, right? The model we created of the ResNet pre-trained. So you could upload any image here. I'm just going to quickly download an ImageNet example because I don't have one on my local system. So this will also give you an example. Once you see a few of the images, it will give you an example of how the why ImageNet actually works and why it's so accurate. I'm just going to. An image now. So I hope you can see the image. This is of a snake, and it should give you yeah. So this is the the original label that was provided on um, the ImageNet website is for a rock python, and it gives water snake as the first output and rock python as the second output because we're using a ResNet to begin with. It's not very accurate, but. Uh, most of la most large machine learning models for like very very large classification tasks, for example, an ImageNet classification, don't go on top one percent accuracy, which is not it, it's not the first it's not the probability of just the first one that matters. If it's present in the top five, they're more than okay with the uh, counting that as part of its accuracy. And because this is second, it's pretty good, right? So now you could change the number of top classes to whatever you want. So you could change this to five or ten and so on. And this is essentially what your um, model looks like. Now you could use this using an API. You could integrate this into Python, or uh, and just you know submit an image on your end using a PIL file format, and you'll get the probability outputs um, again in a very similar dictionary manner as what we're seeing here. So this is a brief intro into model deployment. Uh, once you start like deploying them onto web apps. Which are slightly more complicated, you will probably use something like Flask, or you'll be using something like PyTorch.js or TensorFlow.js, which are libraries that PyTorch and TensorFlow have essentially built into their platforms, which can um, convert your code very directly into JavaScript code and uh, just directly use it from there. Um, all right, so are there any questions regarding this? Okay, seeing none, so then we'll proceed to multi GPU training. We'll come to hyperparameter tuning at the end. Uh, so, for multi GPU training, you need multiple GPUs, right? That's sort of a prerequisite. I will just be sharing my screen in a second. And I'll use the same notebook. So, same notepad file. Uh, so, essentially, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to create a very simple Python program. Actually, you know what? I'll do it in Colab because it's easier to debug there first. And then I copy it to Notepad and then upload it to the server. All right. So we'll start by building a simple confnet. I haven't imported classes yet. Okay. 
so essentially the library that we're going to be using for creating this is called pytorch ddl so distributed data parallel uh what it does is is that it span is that it spawns multiple processes and each process tends to its own gpu so if i have four gpus to my system it will spawn four processes and each process will be independent of the other uh and the data parallel and, and the data parallel package essentially make sure that each uh each process only has to deal with one mini batch at a time so what it does is that it will give each process a mini batch now let's say one process just happens to get faster because of whatever randomness that takes place right in in hardware systems and um, what is what what's going to happen then is that uh your the, the next batch will start for that specific gpu so what it'll do is that it'll take the gradients from the previous batch the one which just ran and is is concurrently running on the other three gpus and it'll average those out so that it can have a final gradient averaging on the on the net model right so uh slightly confusing but if you draw out four separate gpus on your on on a piece of paper and sort of see what happens if one gpu is running faster than the other you'll be able to see that ddp's sole purpose is to make sure that if they're not running concurrently you either slow one gpu down and make them run concurrently or you sort of use memory in a manner in which gradients can be updated so that there is no problems with with uh, with with uh, the speed of which the gpus are working at uh now ddp is an integrated pytorch package it's not something that should be an issue i'm just going to share the tab for the documentation yeah here so um they also have a tutorial in github you could go through that i've mostly whatever i've learned through for for this i've done through this there is another package in uh pytorch it's not exactly pytorch it's called pytorch lightning where um you don't have to worry about the ddp system by itself the config file you create for your uh, entire um folder let's say you're doing a large deep learning project right which includes multiple files and multiple folders or single folder multiple files you'll have to create a configuration file for that for a pytorch lightning type system and in that it automatically handles multiple gpus but because we want to like restrict ourselves to learning about how ddp works we'll just be using ddp directly we won't go into pytorch lightning uh also because we haven't learned config files yet so configuration files is it's not a complicated thing but it takes a while to get used to it and sort of know how to make changes to it for it to work so um yeah so this part is one of the most important things because it sets the uh it it sets up a local port for all your processes to interact now what this means is that all your processes sort of need a place where they can send each other data and make sure that um they're all running concurrently or whatever issues that parallel systems have i'm not familiar with parallel uh programming or parallel os systems if there are any but this essentially creates a port for them to interact with each other and this will initialize um whatever it is that you need to initialize glue is a package created by facebook you can go through that on your own don't necessarily need to know it you can just sort of like work with it as it is and um, yeah so this is essentially what is the the basic framework of what we'll be working with now couple important things that i just want you to look at if you have multiple gpus each gpu is essentially given a rank which is what process it is part of right so if you've got let's say four gpus they'll be labeled 0 to 3 so 0 1 2 and 3 and it's important when you pass your uh for for each process right so when you have a demo basic this essentially corresponds to each process so there are going to be four separate demo basic functions that are running parallelly if you have four gpus which is what we'll be running on and here uh each model needs to go to its specific gpu and not on any random gpu so you need to specify the rank of what gpu you are passing to and what and and so on and so forth so we will see this in code but it's important to know that the easiest way for you to debug whenever you're using ddp and the rest of your model works fine is to check where you're passing your G what what gpu and what id it is being passed to 
because most likely that's what's going to give you an error or at least it has for me it could be different for you right so coming back to the code so just going to import a few basic functions uh, libraries uh as do we need Uh, also, one one more thing, you can't do multi GPU training on Colab. Colab only offers you a single GPU. So what we'll be doing is we'll write the code in Colab. I'll copy it to a text file, upload it to a server, and uh, once that is done, I'll show you the results on the server. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. Everything here is some very similar to what we've already been working on. And uh, this we'll be building for MNIST. This because it's smaller and will be very, very quick to train on multiple GPUs. No, no other reason. Uh, you could build this for anything. Made a mistake. All of these D's are small. We we'll just copy this and create. Mm. They're pretty similar. So that had a. Sixteen tunnels. This will have thirty-two. Nothing else changes. Not um. Yeah. And then it's just a question of self. What F C? And then what? How large this is going to be? Um. Should be seven eighty four. Let me check that. Seven nine 
Yeah, this is what our init function looks like. Now we just have to define a quick forward function, which is again not terrible. So self dot layer one x. Uh, how is uh, layer two x not x? Um, now we need to reshape this for it to go through the fully connected. So out dot reshape. Put that size zero. And out is zero. And all right. So um, I hope nobody has any problems with this, with the class that we, with the model class that we made. We've built this a few times before, so I think we should all be okay with this. Um, right. So now we'll come to building the slightly tricky part of no, not tricky part. You just have to make sure you follow documentation for this. Um. Right, so def main. Now we'll be using something called a parser, which I'm sure you've seen in previous lab, but I don't think we've explicitly discussed this. Now, what an what a parser essentially does is that it gives you the ability to sort of add arguments, uh, which can be like easily um sort of decomposed by other libraries. So if you want to use something like a, like if let's say PyTorch has a, has a library which it needs to uh, use for hyperparameter tuning, you can add your hyperparameter through this, specify the names of your hyperparameters and your uh, library will be able to use this to sort of parse through them effectively. We haven't imported our parse, which is a problem. So we'll just add some basic arguments, uh, which are going to be relevant for our code. So we'll start by the number of nodes that we have. Um, just one more thing I need to explain, which I have forgotten to one sec. Right. So, uh, we need to understand like what distributor training means, right? So as I've explained, it's essentially a bunch of parallel processes working together and each process has its own set of images or its own mini batch, which it uses to create a gradient and which it creates like a backprop. Um, and that backprop is then averaged across multiple GPUs to create like a single large model. And because it's happening parallelly, it's faster, right? You can, if you have four GPUs, it should in theory be four times as fast as a normal process as, as a normal single GPU training setup, right? Uh, it doesn't exactly happen four times as fast because there's something called a uh, warm start that needs to be done and GPUs take a wow. while for data to be loaded initially, which is why it'll be like slightly over four times, slightly less than four times as fast, or the time will be slightly more than one fourth, right? Uh, now what parallel systems can mean is that like you have a single node, right? Like on a single system, you have multiple GPUs. So I have four GPUs, let's say on a single system, or I have multiple nodes in a, or, or I have multiple nodes or multiple systems across which I want to use all the GPUs. So let's say I have three systems, one with one GPU, one with two and one with four, and I want to utilize all seven, right? So that means that the number of nodes that I will have are multiple, right? Um, and, uh, the number of GPUs that I will have per node will also vary. So I need to specify that as part of my uh, arguments here. 
that also changes your world size now world size is essentially an something that pytorch ddb requires which essentially is that um it needs a total number of gpus which is the number of nodes into the number of gpus right because um, now here we're going to work with the simple assumption that each system or each node has the same number of gpus because it's very very easy to work that way if you have multiple you need to specify each node individually and each and the number of gpus for each node now unfortunately i have not had the opportunity to work with a system that big my work has mostly been limited to two or four gpu systems on a single node so i don't know if you will face any problems when you manually define the nodes and the number of gpus per node but again the documentation is very comprehensive if you have that kind of gpu access i would recommend you try it i don't so i can't unfortunately Right. Uh, now, as I showed you in the documentation, you need to specify a what do you call it? A port for you for your system to work, right? So, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to follow the documentation exactly because there's no reason not to. Uh, we haven't really required to stray from it very strongly. Now, this is the most probably the most important part of the um, of the setup, right? This is what is going to spawn your processes. Now, those familiar with probably sub, with some familiarity with parallel systems or just threading would know that you need to spawn a process for it to actually exist. Um, and this function takes care of the entire thing for you. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. So, n pros, n props, not processes. Um, start GPUs, and you need to pass the entire set of args as well. One sec. Yeah, some libraries that I've forgotten to import.
am missing something? Yeah, torch not out. Why not specify the train yet? Yeah, so we have not specified a train yet. So what I'll just do is I'll create a def train pass for that. This won't give an error. It is still giving an error. Yeah, have a good. So um are there any questions up until now? Because after this things get slightly more complicated because there are certain like lines in the code that you'll have to either remember or go through the documentation exactly. If you like miss those lines, the error is incredibly large and very, very difficult to deal with. Um, so yeah, I would just like request that you pay attention to what these specific lines of codes are. I will send you the lab sheet by, by tomorrow and I will specifically comment that these lines are like the most important ones. You cannot miss these lines. If you miss these, it's going to be bad, right? That's sort of the point. Uh, and you need to understand what a lot of these lines mean, because again, you haven't learned parallel systems. To be fair, neither have I. Um, I still have a lot of courses left that I would like to do for parallel systems and parallel programming. And hopefully after that, I will understand what is happening here a little better. But for now, and at least for the purposes of this, this lab, which is like supposed to be more on the application side. Uh, I hope you'll be able to use a parallel GPU system effectively, like given the opportunity, because again, not easy to get a parallel system to begin with. Right. So now we'll just write the train function. And it's going to be similar to the kind of train functions that we've written in the past, in that it is going to include all your basic functionalities wherein you'll have, um, like you'll define a criterion, you'll define an optimizer, you'll define your model, or data set sampler loader, you'll do all of these things. Um, and then you'll have your for loop, right? So all of these things will still exist. There will be no changes there. The only additional things that you need to worry about is uh, setting an initial manual seed, uh, setting your ranks and making sure that uh, your model is on the DDP framework, not on like your original framework. So those are the few things that you need to worry about. And I will write those down now. Right now, so what is this GPU doing, right? So this GPU is the rank of the current GPU that you're on. So if this is zero, for example, that means the rank of your current GPU will be zero. Uh, NR is, is an internal part of the DDP documentation. Not something you need to understand. Just make sure you write this code correctly. Now if we'll be creating our model, um, creating an instance of the earlier class that we've defined. Uh, now this is another important part of what we need to worry about. Earlier, what we used to do was that we used to set our device to any GPU, right? We just, we never wrote this line. So I'll just show you what happened when we don't write this line. And we just used to do torch.cuda. And what torch. Sorry, model.cuda. Not auth.cuda. And what model.cuda does is that it will send your model to the first GPU that it finds. And your first GPU will generally be of the type CUDA0. Right? You've probably seen this as part of your documentation before. 
you've probably seen CUDA zero before. Uh, but once you do torch all CUDA dot set underscore device to GPU, which is the rank of your current GPU, right? Which we saw here, right? Then it will be able to sort of one sec. And now when you do model dot CUDA, it will be able to run even even now you will still have to set model dot CUDA to GPU. Right? Now this will not do what will set to specified GPU. Not CUDA zero. So I hope we're clear with this and what this means. Uh, we set a batch size of 100 because our GPUs are massive. We've got, I think, 32 GB GPUs on the system that I'm on. Um, yeah, so this is an MNIST, so it's cross entropy loss. Again, dot CUDA GPU. So as, as we've discussed in like the previous, um, I think on the second lab when we were building a conf net, the major problems that you face are like problems like these, right? Because when you don't do CUDA, CUDA GPU here, your criterion is running on your CPU, but everything else is on your GPU, which means that there is no interfacing possible between those two, at least not while training, right? You can, there is some level of interfacing because obviously you're sending something from CPU to GPU and you start training, but you can't directly interface them during training. It, at least it's not efficient, right? So you need to make sure that everything is on that when you start. So optimizer is torch dot optim dot sgd, stochastic gradient descent. You could use Adam also, whatever your favorite optimizer is. And we'll set our learning rate to 10 by minus 4. Right, one more important aspect nn dot parallel dot distributed data parallel. And to this, you need to pass model and device underscore IDs. G. Again, documentation, don't need to worry about how or why this works. Just remember that earlier when we used to use our model, we used to use it directly. Now you need to pass it through a distributed data parallel wrapper so that it makes sure that, again, um, all your parallel processing is taking place properly. Right. After this, it's just data set loading that's left, right? Our model is now ready. So train data set is just going to be MNIST. Vision. Dot data sets for time list. And it is small. Download equal to two. And the only transform we'll be using is just two tensor. Right, now train sampler. Another important part of uh, what we're trying to do today. Uh, reason being that you need to have a number of rep that, that you need to make sure that uh, the number of replicas you have, right, or the number of um, mini batches that you'll create should be in tandem with the number of GPUs you have or the number of, or, or your world size, which is the number of nodes times the number of GPUs. So, Again, there's a very simple wrapper function for it, which looks very intimidating, but it's actually very simple once you know what to do.
right so that's that's it you just need to pass your data set the number of replicas which the world size again and the rank of your current gpu so that is your train sampler now your train loader and needs to be built using the oh sorry this one does not need to be built using a distributed sampler this you can do using a simple um data loader search to total so data or data loader batch size we've already defined the batch size so we just need to make sure that we keep that one so i'm not sure why the number of workers here should be zero i have not explicitly tested it using uh, multiple i would recommend that you try um but yeah i don't know what happens if you use multiple workers there i think it would be faster but the number of processes that you spawn will be too many but again haven't really gone through the testing process to see what happens and the total steps for this specific process would be the length of the train loader right and uh, this is before a loop start so we can print the time difference also which is sort of what the point of multi gpu training is right so i'll just do date time not now here so date time is an is, is a python library that gives you the date and time um yeah i don't know how to put it better so now this start standard training loop Images has to be images dot coda. Non blocking coda two. i'm not going through like all of this in detail because again we've done this nearly every lab now uh so you should be relatively familiar with this so now this is just printing the loss out for every 100th mi batch and we'll do it specifically for the 0th gpu uh, you could do this for every gpu but why would you right you just you will have too many print statements to worry about uh printed statement to worry about when you're reading it so i'll just like leave it like this for a single gpu you could use any gpu here no issues
yeah uh, this is our print statement and once our loop is complete we want to see what the time taken was right so let me just check if on the right end and it's like it now if gpu equal to equal to zero then we'll do print trained in time our date time dot now now this is not a hundred percent accurate because there will be some delays with everything that takes place now we are defined start here right yeah we have and this will run if right so this is our entire main function this is our entire confident module and our main function takes care of the entire distributed part and this is just the module that we built right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to set gpus to one for now and i'm going to run it in collab and see what happens and later we'll add we'll i'll upload this to the server equal to, equal to and then we'll see what happens on multiple gpus right so we'll just make sure that it works here first hopefully it does it does not let me just check what the shows Yeah, I think the problem here is with os.environment because that is not supported on Collab. Uh, but I think the code is mostly right. Let me check the code, then we we'll upload this directly to the server and test it there. Seems about right to me, so I'm just gonna copy it down now. If in case there are any dependency issues, we will be, for lack of a better word, in some trouble because those are the worst kinds of issues to resolve. We got access to the server very recently, so it's much that could be done. 
Yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing a tab and start sharing, I think, a window or a screen. Or actually, I'll just upload it first and then I'll go ahead with that. Essentially, what I'm doing now is I am uploading my, yeah, I hope this is visible, yeah, is that I was uploading the file to a server on the, I wouldn't say internet, but there's a, there's a server that we use. Yeah, I just need to stop. Right, uh, so we are here now. And the file we uploaded is now here. So, hoping for no dis for no dependency issues. I'm hoping that this yeah, there's no torch. So, yeah, this is gonna take a while to work. Uh, but let's see if there's another server that would do this for us. Okay, yeah, so basically what the problem is that the server doesn't have the dependencies that we need for now. Uh, so what I'll instead do is I'll make sure that the dependencies, once they're resolved, have, I'll send you the screenshots of how they look like. Uh, essentially, like one fourth of the time will be taken for four GPUs, uh, half the time for two GPUs, uh, pretty standard stuff there. Uh, nothing you should be particularly worried about. Um, now, a little bit of theory going into um, hyperparameter tuning. So, I won't go into like how you should potentially do hyperparameter tuning. There are many ways to do that now. Uh, but as a whole, you should probably look at like just the different ways to do it, right? So, let's say here we've got the number of epochs as a hyperparameter and let's say batch size as a hyperparameter. Uh, this, now these are training parameters, right? This is what you would do to make sure that your training works well. Now let's look at what model hyperparameters look like. Hyperparameters. Uh, number of layers, um, size of layer, um, so on and so forth, right? Um, learning rate is an important hyperparameter. Uh, when you work with slightly more complicated uh, learning rate systems, there will be different types of learning rates that you will be using and like learning rate schedulers that you'll be using, LR schedulers and so on. Um, an example of a machine learning hyperparameter in case you're familiar with something like a random forest, 
so like random forest or slash decision tree hyperparams uh, depth of tree uh, number of like leaf nodes stuff like that so how do you really work on these things um the easiest way to do it is to make sure that you log your runs um you can log your run using either a console.log or you could like write them to a text file um so ways to deal with log to text file uh now why do you need to log to a text file so that you can keep track of your runs so basically when you are grid searching now what is a grid search first grid search essentially what you'll be doing here is that you'll take like a multiple sets of hyperparameters and try them out randomly now obviously after a point there'll be some level of intuition that we that you'll be using but in case you don't like for example i still don't have a a good sense of intuition with hyperparameters uh, except for maybe learning rate but even that is just comes after running it a few times so you just need to stick, define a set define sets of random values or probable values if if you think probable values if you've seen them before and like generate the cross product for each of them for each and just run them there are some softwares that do this for you there are some packages that i think do this for you now uh but essentially what they all do is grid search now there is a better way to do it which is called bayesian tuning there for each hyperparameter run like let's say i run a random value first right um the next value or the next value that it will try will not be random anymore it will be based on the outcome of the previous values so that's what a bayesian tuning means that it's defining its probability space or the space that it wants to work in as as you may recall from uh, the base theorem as the set of what it's already seen before right so there is something called bayesian tuning which is a lot less random but could be could get you stuck in local minimas local minimas or not the most efficient hyperparameters uh why this is the case thought thought experiment um yeah you probably should think about why this takes place uh think about it similar to what our discussion on initialization was and how certain types of initializations can get you stuck in local minimas i will also recommend a paper in case you are interested and get you stuck in local minimas i will also recommend a paper to you if you are interested in reading that uh for initialization that could be interesting you could read the lottery ticket hypothesis it's slightly more complicated not as straightforward as this random initializations and and let's say a zebra and let's initialization pattern but the lottery ticket hypothesis will give you a better understanding of what certain initializations can do for you and how important they are so this is i think an iclr 2020 paper uh but yeah that's essentially what i wanted to like tell you about hyperparameter tuning not something that's particularly complicated not something that's um like even very difficult to deal with it just needs a little bit of mind mindfulness on our part which i generally lack so it's troublesome for me but uh yeah you could probably just grid search your way through it but if it's a very large model you could try bayesian tuning or find some sort of library that would do it for you um but yeah that's all from what i sort of wanted to cover for today